try to discuss the case a little bit, we're going to use a fictitious case of Mr. X, who is a very difficult case of COVID-19. He's 62 years old, comes into a medical center with his son, been unwell for six days, starting off with dry cough, fever, fatigue, looked a little bit, seemed to be getting okay, but then went downhill, becoming more unwell, very short of breath, tired, and looking unwell. No obvious contact with a COVID case, but there are vague possibilities. He did, um, his son does go out to work and could have brought something home. He did go out to preview an apartment, and even though it's SOP compliant, we've seen there are many ways a virus can spread, and masks are not actually capable of filtering out particles to size of a virus with complete efficacy. His saturation of room air is only 78%, and his COVID test is positive, as are his wife and sons. He's put on 100% oxygen on CPAP, but there's not much improvement, so he's ventilated. And because things are so um, so short-staffed and in, in lacking in space right now, he can only be ventilated in a temporary ICU. So um, when you're thinking of COVID-19, the whole pathophysiology of Mr. X's clinical symptoms were all very, very respiratory. And as was mentioned right at the start, COVID-19 is a respiratory virus. It in Its portal of entry is the respiratory system, it can invade the cells of the nasal and oral epithelium and the nasopharynx, and in particular, um, the cells of the alveoli and the bronchial branches are very, very vulnerable to COVID-19. I'm sorry, to cause COVID-2 infection. You can see that the concentration of the virus is high in the nasopharynx and throat, and you can find it in the stool and also in the sputum. It is not easy to get a clean sputum sample, which is why it's not always the most clinically reliable specimen. In terms of the host cells, you can also see the number of cells available that can be infected. And again, you can see pneumocytes would be a really, really important target. So if you were taking samples for diagnosis and you wanted to actually isolate the viral particle, it would make a lot of sense that you go for the nasopharynx of the throat, where you can actually have a high chance of getting viral RNA. Even though the pneumocytes and alveoli have a very high percentage of cells, these are highly inaccessible to actually get a reliable clinical sample from. You could do a bronchial from a batch, but it is highly invasive, and you would be subjecting to the person conducting that test to a very high risk of exposure, when, which is probably unnecessary. In order to diagnose COVID-19, you'd actually have to either locate and identify particles of the virus itself, or locate antibodies against the virus. However, when you actually want to diagnose a disease in the early stages, it makes a lot more sense to look for the virus rather than the antibodies because the antibody response takes time. And if you're looking for the virus, your two methods are either to do a PCR test or to do an antigen test. In PCR, what it actually means is they're actually trying to isolate viral RNA and actually put that through a series of reactions which amplify the viral RNA and, um, and then detect it. So in this case, with the smallest um, smaller starting amount of RNA, you can actually amplify it sufficiently to detect. With an antigen test, it is a more rapid test and it's a much simpler test, but it doesn't amplify the existing genetic material, it just detects what's there. So it is less um, sensitive and may miss patients with a lower viral load. And with, what sample do you take for this test? You have to get a cell that actually contains the virus and the most accessible one would be um, a nasopharyngeal swab which is something we've all seen and heard about in this current COVID-19 pandemic. You can do antibody tests, which involve taking a blood sample and analyzing for antibodies. There are rapid tests for antibodies and you can send them to the lab for serology. And this is a very sensitive test. Um, however, uh, this is a very specific test, but it doesn't actually help you very much in the early stages of diagnosis simply because antibodies are not formed until you're at least a week to 10 days into the infection. So if we look at how you detect SARS-CoV-2, what you can actually see is that this is a graph showing you probability of detecting whatever it is you're looking for, virus or antibody, and this is time from infection. This dotted line shows you when the symptoms start. So if you're gonna look at this, you're gonna see that the dotted lines represent antibodies um, with the green one representing IgG and the purple one representing your IgM and all the other solid lines actually representing detection of the viral particles themselves from various different samples. So if you've been exposed somewhere here where the infection starts, most of the time people will start manifesting um, symptoms somewhere within the second week. But if we take it here, you can see that the probability of detecting the virus itself starts around a week before the onset of symptoms. 
and clients to actually start peaking just before symptom onset, meaning that viral load is actually highest just before symptoms start, making it highly transmissible just before the infection actually rears its head. And this means that screening at this point would probably be positive. However, you would not screen this person unless they were at risk. And this is again why the virus is so infective, why it's such a successful pathogen, because you could be infected and infective, but you don't know it. And if you actually look at the antibodies, what you're going to see is that they only start to rise about more than a week after the onset of symptoms, whereas your patient was highly contagious in the early stages, meaning um, antibodies are very helpful in epidemiological surveillance to tell you the number of people in a population who have had the disease, but they are really not very helpful in the acute stages when you're trying to detect early infection and break the chain of transmission. In fact, there was a study um, showing that patients who presented with severe disease were found to have lower viral loads compared to those who had a higher viral load at the time of presentation. Um, in the discussion by the authors in this specific paper, what they found, what they postulated was that patients with severe disease were actually presenting later in the time course of infection because it takes time for the symptoms to actually get that bad. So it wasn't, so they could have started off with a higher viral load, but by the time they presented, you weren't seeing it. And that was probably why they were seeing results like that. If you actually look at the infection in a single patient, um, the basic R0 number for COVID-19 is 2 to 4, meaning one patient can infect anywhere from 2 to 4 people. And from the time of infection, there is a latent period of three days where the patient is neither infectious nor symptomatic. And then after three days, they generally become infectious. And it's only about two days after that that they become symptomatic. So most of the time, they actually get diagnosed somewhere around here when they are symptomatic and also infectious. However, they are usually, they may also be infectious in the period before that. In general, it is only recommended that screening is done about five days after exposure and that patients should therefore quarantine themselves for five days after, after a possible exposure and test after five days. And this five days is simply because in order for the test to be reliable, you need to be confident that this patient has enough of a viral load to detect. And as we know, once you're infected, the virus begins to multiply and you need the virus to multiply enough to be confident you're getting a good sample. Otherwise, it's really pointless. And the key point here is, of course, asymptomatic patients are infectious. How would you treat a confirmed case of COVID-19? Well, at, at the moment, there is no universally agreed upon protocol, but there are broad principles of treatment that every, all clinicians are agreed upon. Essentially, there are symptomatic treatment, which would be simply to keep the patient comfortable, but are non-specific in terms of treating the virus. You can have bronchodilators if the patient seems to be in respiratory distress, antipyretics to make the patient more comfortable, and respiratory support if the patient appears to be in any form of distress. And this could be supplemental oxygen or um, going into positive pressure support, whether that would be CPAP or ventilation. Then, of course, there would be complication, um, treatment targeting complications, and there is a huge degree of debate whether this treatment should be a therapeutic or prophylactic. And this would include anticoagulants, antibiotics for secondary bacterial infections, and anti-inflammatories in order to reduce the risk of the hyperinflammatory response, which may then cause, which is related to the cytokine storm, which may then cause a wide range of damage to many other organs. And then, of course, there's the possibility of using antivirals, although there has not been any specific antiviral that has shown a very strong response against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. This is just an example of some of the ventilatory strategies that can be used. Most of the time, the typical strategy that we see in many ICUs, especially in Malaysia, is the typical invasive ventilation where an endotracheal tube is actually placed into the trachea and into um, the lung, but definitely above the carina, allowing air to be pushed in and out of the lung in order to mechanically inflate the lungs and help the patient to breathe. Um, Non-invasive ventilation is an option, however, this does have the risk of being um, less secure in that there is more likely for viral particles to be able to exit from the system and contaminate the surrounding environment. However, there are variations of the non-invasive ventilation available currently, which are supposed to be able to minimize that. In fact, at the moment, there is a, as we all know, there is a huge dilemma in the fact that there is a lack of ventilators and a lack of 
proper ICU facilities because hospitals are simply being overwhelmed by the sheer number of COVID-19 cases requiring respiratory support. And again, even though um, the actual percentage of cases is small, the fact that there is such a sheer overwhelmingly large number of cases means that even a small percentage of ill cases is a very big number to cope with. A large number of drugs were actually considered in order to treat this COVID-19 infection based on our understanding of how the virus works. We know that the virus actually enters the cell utilizing the ACE2 receptor and TRPS, TMPRSS2. So camelstat mesolate, a TMPRSS receptor, was tried. Arbidol, which targets the spike protein and ACE2 interaction, was trialed, as well as um, hydroxychloroquine, which was supposed to inhibit viral entry and endocytosis via a whole range of of effects and also by modulating the immune response and a wide range of other antivirals which were believed to inhibit various enzymes and polymerases which had a huge role in the viral replication and actually being able to synthesize new viral proteins. And of course um, drugs like interleukin-6 um, interleukin inhibitors which would then which would help block the hyperinflammatory response were also considered. Um, however, the solidarity trial did not show any significant benefits to using any of these antivirals which were, hope, which were postulated to be helpful. Ivermectin is a current drug that has been touted as being um, helpful in being able to fight COVID-19. Um, although there have been clinical trials that have shown promise, so far, none of them have been convincing enough to recommend this as a routine therapy. Um, ivermectin is believed to have a wide range of possible effects by actually inhibiting and disrupting binding of SARS-CoV-2 to its receptors, by actually blocking the importing proteins which allow the viral um, substances to be imported into the nucleus in order to facilitate replication of its RNA, and by inhibiting the inflammatory response to its action on the STAT3 protein. In terms of treatment guidelines, although we don't have very specific um, clinical protocols, in general, these are the guidelines in Malaysia, where category one does not need any treatment, and category two, which is symptomatic, but no pneumonia, you don't actually need specific treatment, but they need close monitoring, and they may deteriorate, hence monitoring of oxygen saturation is vital. In stage three, they do have pneumonia, but again, this is an uncomplicated pneumonia. So that since there is no specific treatment that we know is really going to help with the virus, there is no treatment recommended except for really close monitoring and supportive treatment as necessary. However, if the patient has high risk factors, um, then the patient should be started on, on additional drugs to prevent any of the complications following guidelines for stage four, which would be antivirals in Malaysia, favipiravir is recommended immunomodulatory treatment with steroids, and possibly um, interleukin-6 or convalescent plasma, sorry, interleukin-6 inhibitors or convalescent plasma, and, um, and prophylactic anticoagulants. In stage five, it's individualized by the ICUs. And just reminding ourselves that thyroperior actually inhibits the viral RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is a key step in viral replication. These are some of the warning signs that are actually used as a guideline to go for more aggressive treatment for patients with pneumonia who may not actually require oxygen as yet. And uh, these are some trials which actually have been performed, which indicate that there has been that has been shown that using dexamethasone for critically ill patients reduces mortality by a third. And for patients who need oxygen, it actually cuts mortality by a fifth. So this actually shows that patients with increasing um, patients with increasing severity seem to have a stronger inflammatory response, and therefore seem to show better response to treatment with steroids. As we all know, steroids have a huge range of effects, of possible detrimental side effects, and therefore they need to be used with caution, but the risk-benefit ratio seems to weigh in their favor of using steroids in patients at a higher risk of progressing into a hyperinflammatory state. So let's think a little bit more about the virus, and we've all heard a lot about variants of concern. So if we consider this patient in our scenario, and if his virus goes for genetic sequencing and is found to be the Delta variant, this would then 
require consideration in terms of prognosis and public significance. Variants of concern like the Delta virus are essentially still basically the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but there are sufficient elements that have mutated or altered within the genetic code that they now have slightly different properties, especially of interest to us, its transmissibility and its virulence. There are many different variants that have emerged during this pandemic, but the current variants of concern would be the alpha, beta, gamma and delta, with delta being the most worrying at the moment with a double mutation. These variants were believed to have come from simply the fact that when this virus is replicating millions and millions of times, there are going to be errors that occur. And some of these errors may actually confer advantages properties on the virus, allowing it to become easier to transmit and causing a more um, virulent infection. Um, there has also been the suggestion that immunosuppression in patients may actually cause them to have a chronic COVID-19 infection and allow this virus to multiply within them, creating virus variants within their body. And particularly if these patients are admitted to the hospital under a wide range of treatment, they may actually become a reservoir for a wide number of viral variants. In this particular paper, it was reported that a patient who was admitted for almost 100 days with COVID-19 and eventually unfortunately died in the hospital had five separate strains of COVID-19 in his body at the time of his death. And just to show the public health significance of this, the different strains of COVID-19 actually have very different um, very different transmissibility rates with the Delta virus being having an R0 of 5 to 8 compared to the original virus, which had one of about 2.4 to 2.6. Okay, so that's been my attempt to try and share a little bit about this COVID-19 infection, the kind of um, how the virus spreads, what it does in the body, and how the pathophysiology as we understand it ties up to the disease manifestations that we see and to especially in terms of disease severity and progression and how that in turn ties into the treatment that is recommended. However, given the fact that this virus is still spreading very, very fast and um, not a very, and a relatively small percentage of the total population has been inoculated at the moment, the key step right now to keep everything healthy and to keep the world functioning is to break the chain, stop the spread, comply with SOP, stay home, and get vaccinated as soon as possible. And let's all just keep hoping that science and medicine and human and everyone working together will triumph and that this pandemic will soon be nothing but an unpleasant memory and that we can all move forward.